He is Jim Miller, writer, producer, media consultant. His new book, Powerhouse, the untold story of Hollywood's creative artist agency. That'll hit bookshelves August 9th. He also wrote Those Guys Have All the Fun, the ESPN book, and uh, Live from New York, the completely uncensored history of Saturday Night Live. I just saw where Jim tweeted this out. Since 1979, ESPN management has been 100% comfortable with only one person being bigger than those four initials, and that is Chris Berman. But is that coming to an end? Jim joins us now. Good morning, Jim. How are you? Hey, Dan. How are you? Great. Uh, mixed, mixed stories about Chris Berman and his future there at the mothership. Can you clear him up? Well, I think it's clear that he is going to be changing roles. Uh, there's no doubt about it. He is going to uh, ride out this, this football season. But I think that given his, his contract's up, I believe, uh, sometime later this year, and it's time. I mean, it seems like we've been talking about Berman's future since the dawn of man, and I think that we're finally at the point now where it's going to be reconfigured. Um, I think he's too big a, a personality in ESPN history for them to just vote him off the island and hit the delete key. So, and I don't think that's his, you know, that's his wishes anyway. So I think they're going to probably try and carve out some emeritus role with, uh, you know, a variety of functions around that. Do you think Chris is okay with that? You know, I mean, look, sometimes he, he looks like he's tired, and sometimes he looks like he goofed for another 10 years. Um, and there are people inside Bristol who think that, you know, it's time for him to go, and there are people who want him to stay. And that's why I think, you know, if they give him, you know, he still does some sort of, uh, he does like the home run derby, they give him a role at the NFL draft. He's just not sitting in the middle of it. Uh, he can maybe tape a special segment on Sundays from his uh, beautiful home in Hawaii for uh, next, you know, football season a year from now. Uh, you know, kind of keep him part of the the landscape, but not totally remove him. I think that might be the sweet spot. Chris's agent says perhaps people with an agenda put it out there. What agenda would that be that somebody would say that Berman's being kicked to the curb? Oh, well, there's there's a lot of agendas. First of all, you have people who have been waiting. You've been waiting. You've been waiting in line, right? Yeah. So there are people who who want that, who want that seat on Sundays and want that seat on all the other things he does. Um, there are people who you know really believe that his time has passed. I mean, I'm talking about inside. I'm not talking about on Twitter. I'm talking about people in management, people in producing ranks and significant roles. They you know they're very appreciative of what he's done, but. They also feel like it's time to inject a whole new set of, you know, personality into into those roles. People always take it the wrong way when I say that management, even one man, member of management said, we don't want another Berman, and people took that as a negative. And I, I meant it as a tribute to Chris, that he was so big, they they were worried they were going to get more people who would be bigger than the four letters, as your tweet suggested. But... If you're look as you, how does this help hurt? Does it affect the business model that you do have this exodus of name people at ESPN? Does it hurt the bottom line in you know how we consume it? Do people care uh, about this? Well, I think they do. I think that's one of the reasons why they were willing to spend serious, serious money on Skip Bayless. I mean, serious money. And I think that you know because look, in some ways, the knowledge base right, has become a commodity. So you can get the scores, you can get everything on your phone, you can get it from other people. And I think that as a result, the analysis and the personality aspect of it and all the controversial things that people can say in the sports, I think that becomes even more important in this climate. So I think ESPN went through a period where they didn't want strong personalities, and you saw with the Sports Center anchors for maybe like four or five years, they were kind of interchangeable, and no disrespect to any of them, but they really weren't trying to build up individual personalities. The whole new digital center and the big set of Sports Center and all the graphics were the stars, and I think that they're starting to realize now that they need they need more personality. But you know, you look, you and Keith in the early '90s were one of the first victims, or let's say, examples of the fact that ESPN didn't want another Berman. I think you were absolutely right because. I mean, when you guys went on the, got on the cover of TV Guide, 
uh, they were afraid that, you know, you were going to become these runaway stars and ask for all this money and ask for all this leverage, and they weren't prepared to deal with that. You know that better than I. He's Jim Miller. The uh, book uh, Powerhouse, the untold story of Hollywood's creative artist agency, that hits bookshelves August 9th. Also wrote the Saturday Night Live book, uh, the ESPN book. And uh, you're writing the ESPN. Where are we with the ESPN, the movie, Jim? Oh, it came out. You didn't see No, I'm just kidding. Um, we're, uh, uh, you know, waiting for that smoke to come from the chimney. Oh, boy. Don't give up. Okay. Don't give up. All right. Well, I, now you have your ending. Berman walks out of the building at the very end, and you roll the credits. Wow. And you would be picking him up in the car. Hey, well, Chris, it's, uh, yeah. Come on over. Yeah. Uh, I, and also, uh, they'll do these lists sometimes of sports center anchors through history, like who's the best sports center anchor. And, Chris is down the list, and I, I tell people, you forget his impact. What, what he did, when he did it, how he did it. His impact on the early 80s and the development of ESPN is going to be remembered as what? Well, very, very significant, and I think that's, to your point, I think that the 80s were, in some ways, it's probably his, his most effective time in the sense that nobody, a lot of people weren't paying attention to ESPN, right? They didn't get the first half of the NFL till 87. So there were some years before that, even though they had the America's Cup or whatever, there were some lean years. And Chris Berman, particularly with highlights and in the 80s, uh, you know, created a real, a real following and in some ways, you know, set the table for you and Keith and Charlie and Robin and Bob Lee and Craig uh, and Rich Eisen in the in the '90s. So I, I think you're I think you're right that you know Chris Berman in particular with Sports Center and Tom Mees, uh in the '80s they they did the Lord's work. If you look at uh, Fox's attempt, Fox Sports One, and how they're attacking ESPN or the NBC Sports Network, uh, who's taking the right approach here? I don't know if there's one right approach. Uh, I think the right approach is not to go toe-to-toe with ESPN. Uh, you know, when they zig, you zag. I mean, because they Skipper went on a buying spree, and he's got so many properties, and he's got long-term deals on a variety of fronts, even though Big Ten is up now, that to try and duplicate that I think is kind of silly. So I think what Fox is doing and what NBC is doing and to a certain degree CBS, they're trying to – you know, engineer their own landscape and things that they can control and things that they can market without having to compete day to day. The interesting thing, though, about what Jamie Harwitz is doing at Fox is, in some ways, he's decided to take one part of the ESPN umpire, you know, up for battle, which is this whole afternoon discussion time and even now in the morning. So, he has this Jason Whitlock and Colin Coward are going to go, you know, head to head with, you know, some of the most uh, profitable and popular afternoon shows on ESPN, and he thinks he can win. So that'll be interesting. But it's it's certainly um, it's it's costing. He saves some. Jamie saves some money, but he's also spending considerably more on talent on pieces of talent than anyone else is willing to do so uh it'll be interesting to see how that plays out i know you write you wrote the book on uh caa the most uh, powerful agency in hollywood what do you want people to learn take away from this book I guess, you know, the bottom line for me was everybody knows what ESPN is and SNL, and CAA is much more secretive, and yet in many ways it has much more to do with our daily lives. So I don't think people realize, you know, that it's Tom Cruise and Jimmy Fallon and J.J. Watt and, uh, you know, Madonna and One Direction and all these things. So for me, it was kind of an interesting last part of the trilogy, right, because SNL and ESPN were born in the 70s and are still very much with us. CA was born in the 70s, still very much with us, but probably has more influence than people realize. So rather than just kind of like taking a brand that's really well known, I decided to look at something that's less known but probably has more impact. But are you, uh, uh, is it the same approach you did with ESPN and uh, Saturday Night Live that you're letting people tell the story of this agency? I did over 500 interviews. Oh, my God. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You a, are, lot of, a lot of interviews. You are thorough, Jim. I will say that. Well, you are I thorough. mean, look, a lot of these people in this world, though, had never really talked on the record before. And some of the people 
were like, I mean, Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman and tons of stars and directors and everything else were kind of really interesting because they're usually talking about their movies as opposed to their world and how they're represented and why they make certain decisions. And, uh, you know, it was just kind of fun. I mean, Cher was a total blast because she, like her agent, Ron Meyer, basically forced her to do Moonstruck, which she won the Academy Award for. And so it's kind of like just like, you know, what happens behind the scenes of all these things that we know so well. The book is Powerhouse, The Untold Story of Hollywood's Creative Arts uh, Artist Agencies. Uh, hits bookshelves on August 9th. Jim, always great to uh, talk to you. We'll uh, keep an eye on your tweets there. Hey, thanks so much, Dad. Take care. All right, Jim Miller. He wrote the ESPN book and Saturday Night Live, and now with this uh, new one. The Dan Patrick Show, weekday mornings on Audience.